Great news. Scientists are working on a fix for Voyager 1. The historic spacecraft is not dead after all. Also, what was that red spot on the bottom of the sun during the total eclipse? These stories and more on this week's Space News from Ad Astra. Welcome! I'm Swapna Krishna. Well, let's start with the fantastic news from the Voyager 1 team. They figured out what's wrong with Voyager 1, and they're working on a fix. If you've missed my previous updates, basically, since November, engineers at NASA's JPL haven't received any meaningful communication from Voyager 1. The spacecraft, which is now in interstellar space about 15 billion miles away from Earth, has been sending back gibberish for months. The spacecraft's FDS, or Flight Data System, which is responsible for collecting Voyager 1's science and engineering data and transmitting it to the TMU, or Telemetry Modulation Unit. The TMU then sent the data back to Earth. Well, the TMU was sending back gibberish in binary, zeros and ones, and the team figured that the problem was somewhere in the FDS. In March, they sent a poke to Voyager 1, which was designed to encourage the spacecraft to try and reroute around any corrupted systems. Remember that it takes 45 hours each way to communicate with Voyager 1, so troubleshooting can be complicated. Well, Voyager 1 ended up sending back an entire readout of the FDS memory. Now, engineers have been able to determine that 3% of the FDS memory is corrupted, which is preventing Voyager 1's computer from carrying out normal operations. The culprit is likely a chip that stores some of the FDS memory that went bad. It's possible that the chip just went bad, it's been 46 years, or it's possible that it got hit with some sort of energetic particle or cosmic ray. So that's the good news. They're optimistic they can find a way for the FDS to work without this chip. The bad news is that it'll take a few more months to determine what to do, implement it, and get Voyager 1 back in working condition. I will definitely keep you updated. Moving on, did the moon turn itself inside out? That's what new research may be telling us. Scientists think that around 4.5 billion years ago, a Mars-sized planet that some call Thea may have slammed into a proto-Earth. In fact, there may be pieces of Thea buried deep within the Earth's mantle. If you want to know more about that, check out my video. Our moon formed out of the molten debris from this collision between two planets. This is called the giant impact hypothesis, and it's the prevailing theory for how the moon formed. But there hasn't been wide-scale agreement on how the moon coalesced and came together from these pieces and what the early moon looked like. But now there's a new paper in Nature Geoscience that may provide the answer. One thing that has puzzled scientists about the moon for a long time is that some areas of the moon, especially on the side facing Earth, have a much higher concentration of titanium than expected, as much as 10 times that of the rocks here on Earth. Back in 2010, scientists constructed this image of the moon from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's data, which is a spacecraft in orbit of the moon. You can see in this photo that Mare Tranquillitatis looks much more blue than Mare Serenitatis. That's because of the presence of more titanium. And it's concentrated, weirdly, on the side of the moon facing Earth and not really on the far side. After the moon coalesced, it had a magma ocean that quickly solidified as the crust we see today. But underneath, things may have been kind of a mess. The denser material sunk further into the moon's mantle that included this titanium. A previous paper in Nature Geoscience tells us that the reason certain dense elements might be concentrated on the near side of the moon might be because of a giant impact on the far side caused them to migrate and sink. This giant impact, that 2022 paper says, is what created the giant South Pole Aitken Basin, the largest impact crater on the moon. So then, how did this titanium get back to the surface? This new paper posits that after these titanium-rich deposits migrated, they sank in sheets, creating detectable anomalies in the moon's gravitational field. The scientists analyzed these and mapped out the distribution of the remnants. From there, the paper goes, the moon redeposited the material on the surface through lava flows, which is how the moon turned itself inside out.
let's talk about the eclipse. The total eclipse of 2024 is over now, but there's still going to be a lot of cool stuff coming out of it. I'm really looking forward to the results from the science that NASA was doing during the eclipse. But until we have that data, there's some other stuff that's very cool. If you were lucky enough to experience totality, you may have noticed that everything got very dark and the temperature dropped. Here's the thing. That wasn't all due to just the sun's light getting blocked. It's because of the path of the moon's shadow along the Earth when the moon blocks out the sun during totality. When the sun is behind the moon, not only does the moon fully block it during a total eclipse from our perspective, but the moon casts a shadow on the Earth. That is especially clear when you see the eclipse from space. Here are a few very cool views of totality from up above us. This one is from the International Space Station. It's really fortuitous that the International Space Station was in a position to take a photo of totality. Now, this is a wider view from NASA's GO-16 weather satellite. And this video is from the SpaceX Starlink satellite. It's pretty cool, huh? And speaking of the eclipse, if you were lucky enough to experience totality, did you notice a red spot near the bottom of the sun? That was a solar prominence, and there was a distinct one on display during the eclipse. A solar prominence is a bright loop of cool plasma and magnetic field that extends outward from the sun. We still don't know exactly why they form, though they are sometimes tied to sunspots, which are cooler, darker regions on the sun's surface. We know that when prominences occur, it's due to magnetic field lines forming loops that hold plasma to the sun's chromosphere in these structures. The chromosphere is the thin layer between the sun's visible surface, the photosphere, and the corona, which is the sun's upper atmosphere. Solar prominences usually take a day or so to form, but they can last for weeks or even months. They're absolutely huge. The biggest solar prominences can be bigger than even the largest planets in our solar system. The typical size of a solar prominence, though, is about 10 times the diameter of our planet. During a total eclipse, you can occasionally see solar prominences as looped reddish spots extending outward from the sun. Their reddish color comes from their hydrogen emission. It's important to note that the sun's chromosphere also appears reddish during an eclipse because of its hydrogen and helium, but it doesn't look like a distinct spot the way a solar prominence does. If you're wondering what the difference between solar flares coronal mass ejections, and solar prominences are, remember, a solar prominence is cool plasma and magnetic field attached to the sun's chromosphere. Solar flares are bursts of radiation and energetic particles from the sun that aren't attached to our star, while CMEs, or coronal mass ejections, are bursts of magnetic fields and plasma from the sun. A CME is different than a solar prominence because it's not attached to the sun. It is not relatively stable like a solar prominence and is instead ejected outward into space. CMEs and solar flares can also affect the Earth, while solar prominences don't really affect our planet. Let's move on to rocket news. The Delta IV Heavy rocket launched for the last time. This rocket from ULA, or United Launch Alliance, finally lifted off on Tuesday, April 9th, after a scrub on the original launch date of March 28th. The Delta IV Heavy flew a total of 16 missions, including the first test flight of the Orion capsule for NASA's Artemis program. It will be replaced by the Vulcan rocket, which launched the astrobotic Peregrine lander earlier this year. That maiden launch went smoothly for the rocket, but the lander suffered a critical fuel loss after deployment, didn't make it to the moon, and ended up burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. And finally, we are one step closer to the fourth test launch of SpaceX's Starship. The company conducted a static fire test of the Super Heavy booster on April 5th. SpaceX is still targeting early May for this test, but that is of course dependent on a launch license from the FAA. The FAA hasn't yet closed its mishap investigation into the third test flight. SpaceX cannot launch Starship until FAA closes that investigation and issues a launch license. And that is just all the news I have for you this week. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.